William Farrell was a central figure in the Protestant Reformation that called out the legalism and practices of the Roman church. His goal was to direct people back to the truth of Scripture, focusing on it alone as the basis for belief and faith. But this was not always the case for Farrell. Farrell was a Frenchman and was once under the belief system of the Roman Catholic Church. However, in working alongside many Protestant ministers, Farrell heard Luther's teaching about what Scripture really said. Farrell's newfound faith changed his life completely. He was no longer clinging to legalism. So Farrell left Paris and went to Switzerland. And he spent time with Holdrick Zwingli and Martin Luther. Farrell had a passion to go into new towns telling people about the truth of Scripture and encouraging them to join the Reformation. One of these towns was Geneva. And Farrell's story in Geneva is very, very interesting. When Farrell arrived in Geneva, the people wanted nothing to do with his teaching. He began preaching, and they immediately tossed him out of the city gate. Farrell, knowing the need of the true gospel in the midst of legalism, in the midst of the legalism that was being proclaimed by the Roman Catholic Church, he went right back into the city, and they tossed him out again. Only this time, they beat him. Well, guess what Pharaoh did? He went right back into the city to boast of the cross of Christ and forgiveness by faith alone in Christ's finished work. And for a third time, Pharaoh was tossed out of the city gate, and this time someone shot at him. They were so offended by what he preached. Did this stop Pharaoh? No. Pharaoh went back into Geneva a fourth time, only this time they didn't throw him out or beat him or shoot at him. They listened. And they not only listened, they placed their faith in the finished work of Christ. And Geneva remained a crucial place for the Reformation for generations to come, all because William Farrell did not fear persecution He did not care about his own glory, but proclaimed the glory of the cross no matter the persecution that came with it. A life, but not just his life, the entire whole of the Reformation was to destroy the legalism that had proclaimed to be the truth and focus on the truth of salvation by grace through faith. Focusing on the glory of the cross and not the performance of man. This is the focus of the end of the book of Galatians. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. Paul was dealing with a similar legalism and performance-based salvation in the time of this letter. A false gospel that focused on the glory of man rather than the glory of Christ crucified. How much do we need this reminder? I am so prone, so prone to legalism and making little of the sacrifice of Christ. Maybe not in my words, maybe not in what I say, but in how I live, in how I parent my children, in how I interact with others thinking I can earn, thinking I'm good enough, thinking that the sacrifice of Christ isn't good enough. Let's read verses 11 through 18 of Galatians chapter 6. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Verse 15. 
For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Paul begins by urging his, his readers to see, to know the urgency, the validity of the words he is about to pen himself. Instead of a short farewell that Paul typically gives at the end of his letter, letters, he takes the pen from the scribe that would have been transcribing for him and writes a longer goodbye out of necessity. In this closing, we see the marks of legalism and the marks of faith. The marks of legalism and the marks of faith. Legalism is looking to something other than faith in the finished work of Christ to save you. It adds on to the sacrifice of Christ, something you can earn. Legalism tries to add something that man can boast in themselves for. John Piper says, a person who uses the law as a vehicle of pride is a legalist. Let me say that again. A person who uses the law as a vehicle of pride is a legalist. This is exactly what Paul describes in these verses. Paul starts by giving three marks of legalism for us so that we can easily discern when we see it in our own lives and in the lives of others. This is an introspective look to see if we are guilty of such legalism and then an external look to see if those brothers and sisters in Christ are struggling with this legalism. So Paul gives three marks of legalism. First, outward change. Outward change. Look at the first part of verse 12 again. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised. So Paul, turning his attention first to the legalist, the Judaizer, that want to appear put together on the outside, the legalist, the hypocrite, those who claim to be followers of God but live as though something other than Christ saves them, they put on a performance. They wear masks. They display goodness. They focus on bettering what man sees. They focus on the outward behavior rather than the heart. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised. It's a physical focus rather than a spiritual focus. Earlier in chapter 5, Paul warned not to focus on the works of the flesh. And here we see these people's biggest concern is the flesh. They care only about circumcision. They care about the law. In only caring about these things, they proclaim that in order to be good, in order to be right, you have to be circumcised. They stray from the gospel and put unnecessary requirements on people. Instead of acknowledging the gospel as for all people, Jew and Gentile alike, these men were trying to make everyone into Jews through the circumcision of the flesh. This takes the focus off of Christ. This takes the focus off of the heart. They were trying to mix the Old Testament law with the new law that Christ had ushered in, in as the fulfillment of the Old Testament law. Christ fulfills that. And it was trying to mix and say he hadn't. In other words, because of the wrath-atoning sacrifice of Christ, the law is no longer in effect because he alone has paid for my sin. I can't pay for it. There's nothing we can do to pay for our sin. But this is exactly what the legalist tries to do. And how often do we try to do this? Imagine taking a rotten, worm-infested apple 
And you polish up that apple to where it doesn't look rotten at all. Maybe throw some bright red paint on the outside of it so it just looks good. Make it look like the healthiest of apples. As soon as you bite into that apple, the rottenness is going to reveal itself. This is exactly what the legalist does. They polish the outside to make it look like everything is good and everything is right. They thrive and try to impress others with their external piety. And yet on the inside, they are dead and rotten. This is the first mark of legalism. Outward, external change. The second mark of legalism is the fear of man. The fear of man. Look at the rest of verse 12. They focus on circumcision only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. They fear the persecution that comes with the cross of Christ. They fear the persecution of the true believer. This is their only motivation. It is selfish motivation focused on worship of self. They don't want their own lives threatened. They don't want to suffer as Christ suffered. They do not want to suffer as Paul has suffered. In short, they don't want to claim Christ out of the fear of man, not out of a proper fear of God. The legalist does not want to be identified with Christ. Listen, they think to themselves, why would we want to be marred with the same suffering and crucifixion as that of Christ? The cross was polarizing. It still is. The cross was polarizing and following the, the one who was signaled as cursed because he was hung on a tree was polarizing. They had not crucified the flesh with its desires because they feared the crucifixion of the flesh. So why not add law? Why not add legalism to the gospel in order to protect themselves under Roman law? Listen, this is so important for under, us to understand the historical context of this. You see, Jews at the time were protected under Roman law. So if you were a Jew, you had protection. You had freedom to worship. You had freedom to practice the law. But Christians were not. Christians were persecuted under Roman rule, and Jews were given freedom. Legalism that is anti-gospel protected them from being persecuted by man. The selfish motivation of the legalist was fearing man and what man could do to them if they actually worshipped Christ. If they actually had true faith. It's trading a rightful view of eternity for what is comfortable here and now. How quickly do we sometimes, as the legalist, miss the life-giving message of the cross and only see the persecution that it brings? Listen, this may not be as obvious as we, as we see. We're not going to see ourselves maybe fearing death right now like these legalists during Paul's time. But how often do we fear the message of the cross and so we pile on our own righteousness that we think we have to say we're good people? That's not the gospel. That's what these legalists were trying to do. The legalist, in trying to avoid persecution, avoids salvation altogether. They valued safety more than truth. Do we value safety more than we value truth? The first mark of legalism is outward change. The second mark is fear of man. The last mark of legalism is inward worship. Inward worship. Look at verse 13 again. 
For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. While the legalist tries to seem holy on the outside, they are broken. Even though they are trying to fulfill the law and cling to legalism, they will only show their unworthiness. Circumcised or not, they stand guilty. But even though they cannot keep the law, they still want to have others circumcised, this clear mark of the law, so that they can boast in it. Again, God looks at the heart, but they are boasting in an exterior transformation that they have led people into. But this exterior change, this exterior uh, shift, is giving them inward-focused worship. Because it's all that they have to boast in. They can't boast in a changed heart because only God can change the heart. They can't change the heart. I can't change the heart. So instead, they boast in these external accomplishments that mean nothing. But they think it brings them glory. How deceived are they? Think about this in relation to evangelism for a second. Just think for a second about this. Think about our command by Jesus, from Jesus, to make disciples. Sharing the truth of the gospel points only to the glory of God in rescuing sinners, only to his glory. There's no glory for man, but the legalist flips this on its head and says that they have more converts by those who have this external sign of their adherence to the law. Look at my followers. Look at all these that I have led into circumcision. Look at these all that have changed externally. They boast in gaining followers. They, bo they boast in glory they do not have. They boast in power they do not have. Their worship is inward. And all of these marks of the legalist, all of them point to self-worship. They fear man because they don't want to face persecution now. They focus on outward change because they want to look as good as they possibly can in front of man. These are the marks of legalism. Outward change, fear of man, inward worship. We need to examine our hearts. Really examine our hearts for legalistic tendencies. Areas where we are worshiping self, where we are focusing on behavior rather than a changed heart, and fearing man more than we fear our God. But Paul then shifts, and this is so helpful for us, because he's shown us the marks of the legalist, and then he shifts to show us the marks of of true faith. And notice, just notice as we look at these, the stark contrast between the marks of legalism and the marks of true faith. They are direct opposites of one another. So while legalism promotes inward worship, the first mark of true faith is outward worship. Legalism, inward worship. Faith, outward worship. Look at the first half of verse 14. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. This should forever be the believer's proclamation. Far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's only boast is not in himself, but in the cross of his crucified Lord. While others run away from any connection to the cross out of fear of persecution, Paul says there is nothing else worth glorying in. All other boasting is purposeless. All other glory would never match up to this. While the world might see shame and defeat in the cross, Paul knows the truth. There is freedom from the law in the defeat of sin and death on the cross. 
What else deserves our boasting? Thomas Schreiner says, those who boast in the cross understand the law does not bring righteousness. The cross kills the old person and introduces a new reality. The only thing we knew before God rescued us from ourselves was boasting in ourselves. But we live in a new reality a reality of glorying in a slaughtered Savior who has defeated death and sin. Our boast has changed because we know we can earn nothing. Our salvation has come from outside of ourselves, and so our boasting is in Him who rescued us from ourselves. We do not see our rescue from ourselves and declare, how great are we? It would be like Batman saving the damsel in distress and the damsel in distress going, I'm amazing. No, this isn't what happens. We understand the saving that has taken place and so we glory in the only one worthy. The first mark of true faith is outward worship. The second mark of true faith is inward change. So while the legalist, again, while legalism focuses on outward change, circumcision, true faith focuses on inward change. Look at the rest of verse 14 and verse 15. He boasts in the cross by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. What does it mean that the world has been crucified to the believer and the believer has been crucified to the world? I feel like that's a strange statement to make. But if we look at it a little, it, it makes perfect sense. The world is dead to the believer. We see clearly the deadness of the ways of the world or of living for self, of self-promotion, of saying live for right now. The believer is dead to the world though because we boast only in the cross of our Lord something that is so foolish by the, to the world, lo, the world looking at the cross, that's so foolish to them. It looks like we are living out death while we look at the world and we truly see them living out death. We don't look in, in pity at the world and say, how could you live for that? We don't look at the world and say, how foolish but we do mourn because this is the same deadness. This is the same pattern of life that we used to live were it not for God saving us. We mourn because this was us were it not for Christ. What, what, se what once seemed so full of life to us can only be defined by death. The believer sees living out the gospel as our only hope of life. And so, of course, we see the living for anything else as hopeless. This includes living out the law that the legalist proclaims. We can now, in freedom from our bondage to sin, see the dead, crucified world and be separate from it. We are made new. Paul declares that the believer is full of life, full of truth. This motivates our passions and our desires. We desire for God and his will. What he loves, we love. What he hates, we hate. The world boasts in the outward show of circumcision, but Paul clearly states that this means nothing. It counts for nothing. 
Just earlier in Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Or listen to Philippians 3.8. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing, surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. John Piper says, The mindset of the new creation does not just agree that Christ died for sinners. It glories in the cross. It boasts in the wonder of the cross. It cherishes the benefits of the cross. The cross is the pride and joy of the new creation. And in verse 15, we see Paul say circumcision and uncircumcision mean nothing. These outward displays change nothing about our standing before holy God. This is not an extra credit assignment added on to the death and resurrection of Jesus. There's no such thing. There's nothing we can boast in besides the cross of Christ because we glory in the cross. We boast in the wonder of the cross. We cherish the benefits of the cross and the cross is our pride and joy. But through the cross, Jesus has made a new creation and that's what we see at the end of verse 15, a new heart, an inside change, a completely new man. So go back to the beginning to creation, when God spoke everything into existence. He gave, he authored life, physical life. And the first man, the first Adam, chose death. He failed. So the second Adam, Jesus, doesn't just show God's salvation or redemption plan. It displays him not as just the author of physical life, but the author of spiritual life through creating a new creation through the death and resurrection of his son. In other words, I am no longer seen as Corey because of the death and resurrection of Christ. By God, I'm seen as Christ, a new creation. The old me is dead, spiritual life is given. This is the reality of inward change in the life of the believer. The first mark of true faith is outward worship. The second mark of true faith is inward change. And while the legalist only has the fear of man, the last mark of true faith is the fear of God. The fear of God. Listen, you think the reason that William Farrell kept going into Geneva after being thrown out, beaten, shot at, was because he feared man? No, it was because he knew truth and did not fear the persecution of man because of that truth. Look at verses 16 and 17 again. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. All who make their only boast in the cross know peace and mercy. All who fear God instead of fearing man know peace and mercy. They have peace through the cross of Jesus. Romans 8, 6 says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Colossians 3, 15 says, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. The believer knows mercy because God has shown them such mercy in taking out his perfect wrath on Jesus on the, on the cross instead of them. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7 says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. This peace and mercy is to all believers, Jew and Gentile alike. 
In the cross, there is not Jew or Greek. The gospel eliminates any of these divisions. So when Paul uses a phrase like the Israel of God at the end of verse 16, he's describing what he described in Romans 2. Listen to Romans 2, verse 28. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. Verse 29. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Again, it is the new creation that knows the peace and mercy of God. It is Jew and Gentile believer alike. For Paul to go back and say he's talking about national Israel during this last phrase that he uses in verse 16 would not go with the context of the passage. It can't go with the context of legalism and Jewish law. No, it is clear that Paul is saying this is for those who fear God. Jew and Gentile believer alike. This proper fear of God is expanded on in verse 17 with Paul's description of his own persecution. After he expresses that he does not want to be bothered with these issues any longer, and he wants the Galatian church to cling to truth, to focus on truth and not stray from it, he tells of the scars and marks he bears for his boasting only in the cross of Christ. Paul knows the persecution that comes with the cross. But he did not fear this persecution. He feared God only. Paul's scars scream of his commitment to the truth of the gospel. The legalist, they have no marks because they fear man. They fear persecution. Paul knows that, that the per persecution is nothing is nothing compared to the grace, mercy, and peace of God. He knows that his marks are marks of suffering for the sake of the gospel, and Christ suffered so that he could know life abundantly and eternally. So he's not focused on just the here and now persecution, because Christ has made known to him life abundant, abundantly and eternally through his sacrifice, through his death and resurrection. Listen, the book of Galatians closes out not with legalism, but with grace. Paul writes for the grace of God to be with the believers in Galatia. We must be mindful of this exact warning that Paul leaves this church with at the end of this letter. Legalism is not the life of the believer. We cannot add anything on to the sacrifice of Christ. Or you know what we say? His sacrifice was not enough. Listen, it is absurd. It is absurd to think that I can heap righteousness I do not have onto the sacrifice of the one who is perfectly righteous. Let me say that again. It is absurd to think I can heap righteousness I do not have on the sacrifice of the one who is perfectly righteous. Listen, believer, you are already perfectly righteous because he was and is perfectly righteous. You have nothing to earn because you couldn't earn it. Christ earned it for you. He was broken for you. He was victorious over death for you. The perfectly righteous one was slaughtered to purchase our perfect righteousness so that God doesn't see me as my wretchedness. Believer, live out this perfect righteousness. It doesn't mean you are going to be perfect, but it means you are going to live with outward worship, inward change, fear of God. This is how when we come back together, even now during this time, this, is, this impacts how we should live together. 
These marks of faith should define our lives in how we, how we go to our God and how we go to each other. This changes everything about our lives. If you're an unbeliever, listen, you can't earn your way to God. There's no hope in that. You never will be good enough. But Christ paid the price for sin so that you don't have to. He became sin so that you could be right with God. If you don't know what that means, and and you want to know more about freedom in Christ, call us, email us. You can find all of our information on our website. We would love to talk to you. We must be encouraged to live out our faith, to to make these marks of faith our life, and to make sure we're not clinging to the marks of legalism. Let's pray. Father, The message this morning is you are so far above us. You are holy and we are not. You are perfect, we are not. You are right, we are not. You are good, we are not. And so we can't bring anything to offer to you. Except you have already brought what we need. You have have given yourself. You have been slaughtered for our sin. So that we can know life. We can know righteousness. And now we bring our obedience, our our joy, our faithful worship to you. The only one worthy. We cannot worship ourselves because we did not earn our way to you. There's no way we can. And so we worship you. We turn to you. As we close out this book of Galatians. I pray that we are quick to proclaim your grace, that we are quick to proclaim your name, not our own, that we are not clinging to marks of legalism, that we are not worshiping ourselves, that we are not demonstrating external piety, external worship that does not define our heart, but that out of our heart is flowing the fruit of a changed life, that we do not fear man and what man can do to us because it's nothing We have an eternal perspective. You have given us new life that is abundant, that is eternal. We live in that reality. So God, help us to cling to that, to focus on that, to not lose sight of that, and to do exactly what Paul encourages this church to do. Stay focused on truth. Not on opinions, not on lies, not on legalism. Focus on truth. Focus on the gospel. God, we need you for that. So help us, as I know you will, help us to pursue you well. Be with First Baptist Alcoa. Help us to love our God and and to love each other well for your glory, not our own. I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.